everyone. Welcome to LumCon Science Talks 2022. Yay! Uh, we just want to make sure that you can interact with us easily. So you guys on your GoToWebinar dashboard should have a question um, feature. Uh, so you'll use the question feature to interact with um, Dr. Craig McLean, Executive Director of LumCon, myself, Mark Conover from LumCon, and then our two, our two presenters tonight, um, who I'll let Craig introduce. But just to make sure that you can um, use your question feature, go ahead and type in a hello and let us know that you're out there and ready for your science talk. Katie's here. Hi, COVID Katie. <laughs> Yay. Nice to see you in the audience. John, always a pleasure. Good evening, Patrick. Houston. Yay. Georgiana from Houston. Very good. <laughs> You guys are awesome. Anybody know any really good eel jokes? <laughs> well, I all I know is that the world's oldest eel died today. <gasps> no. Yeah. It, he died from an illness. <laughs> <laughs> all right. <laughs> Boss, I'm a bad influence. Yes, you are. You you started this at the beginning of this lecture series. <laughs> For those of you who are new to science talks, this is not unusual behavior, just so you know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Craig, it looks like everybody has figured out their question function. So just Excellent. a reminder, you guys, uh, if you want to engage with us, questions, comments, whatever, um, we're paying attention on this end. Um, and I will be your moderator uh, this evening to interact with the three presenters that we have for you. All right, so Craig. Excellent, well, as Mert mentioned, I'm Dr. Craig McLean. I'm the executive director of LumCon and I am super excited to share tonight with you all. Um, this is our first uh, of our current series that focuses on a series of public talks that uh, look at the intersection of coastal and marine sciences and everything cool that's been going on in engineering and technology. And so uh, tonight we'll learn about robotic eels and future talks will include uh, robotic jellyfish. Um, we'll talk about creating robots that can detect DNA on the deep sea floor and also be used on the oceans of other planets. Um, lots of great talks this uh, this uh, section. The next one will be April 21st, and then followed with a couple in May and in June as well. Um, the reason why we're foci focusing on this is because later this year, um, we'll be opening uh, Blue Works, which is Lum expansion of LumCon's campus in Tahoma. Um, Blue Works will be a 30,000 uh, square foot facility that will have 3D print labs, maker spaces, uh, fabrication labs. Um, we'll be adding new researchers, um, new educational spaces. And what the amazing part about BlueWorks is it'll be completely open to the public. And so we'll have lots of events going on there and we encourage you all um, the, to come to the grand opening later this year when we open the, up BlueWorks. And so tonight I, I want to, I'm really excited to kick it off with a, uh, a couple of researchers here from Louisiana, from the University of New Orleans. Um, the first one is Dr. Uh, Tervella, uh, who is a professor in the School of Naval Architecture and Marine Engineering at the University of New Orleans. Um, he's been a faculty member at UNO for the past 13 years. Prior to becoming a faculty member at UNO, he was employed uh, by J. Ray McDermott and Northrop uh, Grumman Ship Systems. Um, and as well as we have, uh, Dr. Shervasta um, is currently working as a software developer for offshore and hydrodynamic analysis um, software packages, MOSES. He received his doctoral degree from uh, UNO as well. 
And prior to becoming UMO, he sailed as a merchant marine engineer on various cargo vessels and got his undergraduate degree um, in India. And so I wanna thank you both doctors for joining me tonight. We're very excited to hear about y'all's collective work on uh, basically creating robotic eels. And I look forward to hearing about how we can prevent them from taking over the world. All right, thanks for having us. Thank you. I'm working on making you presenter. Okay, no problem. All right, you should have an invite right about now. All right. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. <laughs> All right, great. All right, good afternoon, everybody, or good evening. Uh, welcome to our presentation where we're gonna talk about uh, some of the research that we've been doing uh, for the past 11 or so years on robotic eels. Uh, as uh, Craig said, I have uh, Dr. Shivank Srivastava with me. Uh, he was a former graduate student of mine and we worked on this project uh, for the last five or so years together. All right, some, uh, just a little bit of a motivation or, or why we were motivated to, to research eel-like robots. Uh, First of all, most of our research has been funded by the U.S. Navy, so the U.S. Navy has had an increased interest in autonomous underwater vehicles in the last few years. And so we felt that uh, there was an opportunity here to use an eel-like robot for intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance type missions in uh, littoral or riverine environments. Uh, the idea here is that we can put these robots in uh, environments and reduce the, uh, sorry about that, and reduce the risk to naval personnel so we can have these uh, robots doing some sort of uh, mind sensing or whatever the case may be. Um, the idea here is that uh, Shivank and I are both hydrodynamicists. So what we were originally interested in was in studying the hydrodynamic wake signature of uh, an anguilliform type swimmer or an eel-like swimmer. Uh, and what we came up with, uh, which we'll talk about in just a minute, was a, a swimming motion uh, that we felt was very highly efficient. Uh, the inspiration from this came from a former professor of mine who originally worked on this problem, where he was out fishing in a lake in um, in South Carolina, and he noticed that a water snake slithering through a surfactant field of spring pollen covering the surface from a farm pond where it left little to no vortices shed in its wake. Uh, so, you know, like, as I said, that's kind of where the background of this started. Uh, Dr. Voris, who was my PhD advisor uh, way back when, he began studying this problem, I believe, in about the year 2000, late 90s uh, or 2000 or so. He was first reached, uh, contacted by a group of research scientists from Northeastern University in the Boston area, uh, where they're more marine biologist types. Uh, Dr. Voris was a... Um, was a hydrodynamicist and they were asking for him to kind of design a model where they could predict hydrodynamic performance of eel-like swimmers. Uh, so what he was able to do was he was able to basically solve the problem backwards and he set the efficiency equal to 100% or what we call the fruit efficiency equal to 100% and solved the problem backwards and he was able to develop an equation for what shape the eel should swim with. Okay, and the idea was here with 100% efficiency that eel actually shed no vortices and therefore we had no induced drag. So typically if you see an eel swimming uh, with just some general motion, which you would see as some shed vortices coming off the tail or you would see some swirls in the motion or swirls in the water uh, coming off the tail uh, every half a tail beat. So um, in this case, there were no vortices theoretically and so we felt like that resulted in a higher efficiency. Uh, so this is gonna be the only equation I show on the screen. Uh, I wouldn't be an engineering professor without at least one equation, but the idea here was that we were tasked with uh, designing an eel robot that would swim with the motion described by this equation here, which is basically just a superposition of two sine waves. Uh, and this uh, motion would give us what we call uh, wakeless swimming or basically no shed vortices. So there's just a little plot on the screen of what that shape kind of looks like. Uh, it also assumes that the eel is able to travel at a certain design speed, which is all input into this equation. So basically, you know, you, you put in uh, how fast you want the eel to go, how much thrust you need to generate, 
and the, the motion here is generated uh, using this equation. Uh, so when we got our first grant, and uh, I guess it was around 2010, uh, you know, we were really excited and we, we jumped right on it and started uh, designing and building a robot. So our first uh, design looks similar to this, where we had a bunch of these segments. I believe the first robot, the first version had about 12 segments in all. Uh, we had just typical servo motors that you find from any hobby shop. Uh, we went ahead and, and built uh, a robot using the parts that you see here. We had a brand new 3D printer. This was back when 3D printing technology was relatively new. Um, the printer that we had uh, was an object Eden 350, which was a, um, it's a polyjet machine. So it used polymers to make printed parts. So it allowed us a lot of flexibility in designing different parts. And we were able to basically design a part, print it overnight, next day, come and put the pieces together, make revisions, you know. So we had a lot of revisions to the design, uh, just mostly on fit up and how things fit together. Uh, but for the most part, each link had one servo motor and four AA batteries, uh, two on each side. Uh, we put the links together. Uh, all the programming was done. Uh, and we programmed a, uh, an Arduino uh, microcontroller that was stored in the head of the eel robot. Uh, and when we assembled everything, uh, what we had was an eel robot that looked similar to this. Uh, we encapsulated everything into a latex skin and we began doing some testing uh, that way. So this is just a picture of that first robot kind of doing some surface swimming in our um, towing tank. All right, the next version of the robot, which we dubbed Neilbot 1.1, um, was a similar design where we still use links. Uh, this time we actually, we instead of getting uh, typical hobby shop type servos, uh, we got more commercial grade servos. So these were more compact, uh, they were much stronger and they were actually a little bit smarter. They had PID controller on board. So uh, we were able to get a lot more control of the motion. Uh, we switched from AA batteries to AAA batteries and we, we tucked them in low. So that helped with some of the stability of the robot and here you can see the uh, the uh, controllers in the head as well. Um, this design also had a much smaller diameter. Uh, the original design had about a two and a half to two and three quarter inch diameter. This design had a, about a two inch diameter. Uh, so that helped us out as well in requiring less torque on the servos. Um, and once we, again, this used 3D printed parts as well. So we had a lot of lessons learned in the first uh, revision of the robot or the first version of the robot to this revision. Uh, you can see we eliminated those battery doors. Those things were a real pain. When we were trying to put the skin on, they would always pop off. Um, so here we we tucked the batteries in. We hardwired those batteries together. Uh, we basically soldered wires to them, and we were able to to create a charging feature where we could charge the batteries through the robot without uh, disassembling everything. Uh, this is a, a rendering on the left and the actual picture of the robot here on the right of everything put together. Uh, so here you can see just all those segments linked together with a head and a tail piece. Um, so in the original work, what we were looking at was studying uh, the wake hydrodynamics of the robot. So, you know, we designed and built that robot to replicate as close as possible that anguilliform motion that we discussed in the, uh, the previous uh, slide. I mean, the previous couple of slides. Um, and we use a technique called particle image velocimetry to study that wake field. So I'll show you a little bit more about the setup in a couple of slides later on. Um, but what we were looking for were vortices or lack of vortices in the wake of the robot. And at the bottom of the screen here, you can see a slide that, that kind of represents our robot swimming. And then uh, these were actual measurements of the velocity field uh, in the wake of that robot. So a few challenges that we faced in that initial work was actually achieving that theoretical motion. Um, even with the upgraded uh, robot, we still had some issues uh, with getting the exact motion that we needed. Um, there were some physical limitations to the servos and, and things like that. Uh, the robot actually had a, a, some trouble achieving that design speed. So at this point, the frictional drag that we had predicted was kind of this quasi-empirical, we, we had taken a quasi-empirical approach in uh, predicting the frictional drag so uh, we needed some kind of better technique in order to predict that drag. So that kind of led us to uh, the second part of the research where um, 
we did a numerical study as well as an experimental study where we were actually looking at what was going on inside of that boundary layer. You know, was the frictional drag that we were predicting using that uh, semi-empirical approach accurate? Um, it was kind of a quasi-steady approach where we just assumed uh, we kind of had steady flow over the robot, but as as the uh, robot is swimming, uh, you know, the flow is changing across. The flow is rather unsteady over the surface, so we didn't know how much of an impact that had played. So that was uh, an additional uh, project from the Navy as well was when we actually went ahead and studied what was going on in that boundary layer. So this is the setup that we use. This is called uh, Particle Image Velocimetry, or PIV for short. Uh, a lot of people that study uh, experimental hydrodynamics use a PIV setup of some sort. Um, but this one is specifically designed for use in our towing tank. Okay, so our towing tank, for those that are not familiar, is like a 125-foot uh, swimming pool, if you will. It's very similar. I often describe it as a wind tunnel for naval architects where we do a lot of scale model testing. So it's a 125-foot swimming pool. It's about 16 feet wide, and we can control the depth of the water up to about six feet deep. Uh, but this device here allowed us to put the PIV equipment below the water line. Okay, so what you see here is a torpedo-like device. And the way PIV works is we actually throw neutrally buoyant particles in the water. And it's it's like a dust particle, but when you put it in the water, uh, you, you can't really see them with the naked eye. Uh, and what we do is um, we illuminate those particles using a laser. And uh, then we have two rather high-speed cameras that take uh, pictures of those particles, and then we can calibrate uh, the cameras and the setup, and then we post-process the pictures that are taken, and then we can create velocity fields. So we actually can see how the water flows near the eel or around the eel or in the wake of the eel. Okay, so this tube here that you see, this torpedo has two cameras mounted inside of the stainless steel parts, um, and there's a laser module as well that directs the laser beam down to below the water line and there's some optics that take that laser beam and spread it out into a fan and we'll see some photos of that set up a little bit later um, but this module of this torpedo is very modular so that we can uh, change the setup reorient the cameras reorient the laser sheet uh, depending upon uh, where we're taking images of so we had a completely different setup for when we were looking at wake structure as opposed to looking at the boundary layer flows. Uh, this is kind of a rendering of how we had things set up. This is a cross section of our towing tank and we have a carriage uh, that slides forward and aft on the towing tank. And what we did here was we actually fixed the eel to the carriage so we could have good control of the, the eel as it's swimming through the water. And you can see the PIV module was set up or the torpedo was set up behind the um, the eel robot, okay, and if you can see, each one of those rectangles represents what we call the field of view, so that's essentially what the cameras are looking at. Uh, the green triangle represents the laser light sheet as it's spread out into a fan, so the laser light sheet is actually illuminating the particles that were dropped in the water, and then it's taking rapid images uh, of those particles, and again, the software kind of interrogates those particles and how they move and gives us velocity field information. So because the field of view is you know, relatively small for the wake that we were looking at, what we actually did was we, we, took, um, we made multiple runs, multiple experimental runs, and we took basically uh, nine fields of view and were able to stitch those images together to create one velocity field within the, uh, the wake of the eel robot. So each one of those little rectangles represents one of the field of views that we were in. So we would reposition the eel relative to the PIV setup in order to get uh, the field of view of interest. And then we would do it again and do it again until we had uh, covered all of the wake area that we were interested in. Uh, this is an actual photograph of the same setup, kind of looking from above. So there you can see our feathering instrument where we uh, we were attached tank you can see the red beam across the top of the photograph uh, you'll see the eel robot kind of in position there uh, you can see the laser light sheet shining uh, within the at the tail of the eel uh, so as this test is moving down the tank we're snapping photographs uh, of those water particles okay so 
that led us to um, some of the more recent experimental work uh, because we noticed that, hey, the eel uh, wasn't quite achieving the motion that we wanted. Uh, it got pretty close, but we did notice a few uh, vortices in the wake. Uh, also that when we let the eel free swim, it wasn't really achieving the, the speed that we wanted it to achieve uh, with the thrust that we were providing. So, uh, you know, that led us, as I mentioned earlier, to believe that there were some issues going on in that uh, boundary layer because of the increased frictional resistance. So the, the next project that we received from the Navy was where we actually examined what was going on in that near body flow field. And then we wanted to characterize certain information about what was going on and determine if that local skin friction was actually playing a part in what was going on with that uh, inability to achieve its speed. And then also, uh, Siobhan will talk in a few slides about some of the numerical simulations that we did. Um, so, you know, we got listed here a few challenges still, the, the some physical limitations with the theoretical motion. We, you know, we we got as close as we could uh, with, with our knowledge of robotics, at least. Um, we had some PIV specific challenges, uh, mostly having to do with spatial resolution. Uh, if you're trying to measure boundary layer flows, some of the flow structures that you're looking at are really, really tiny. Uh, we had uh, magnifiers on top of lenses stacked on our cameras, so we, we basically got as close as we could in this scale of a, of a um, test. Uh, also, there was a lot of laser light glare off the wall of our eel, so off the eel skin, uh, that laser light is shining and it's really bright, and we're trying to take photos right where that uh, water meets the skin of the eel, so when that laser hits the skin of the eel, it's actually reflecting back. Um, so that glare causes some issues that we had to try to mitigate as much as possible. And we did some of that by changing the color of the skin of the eel for our test, painting the tail structure and so forth with dark colors to try to, to mitigate some of that as much as possible. And then also whenever you're dealing with PIV and such a large scale type environment, you know, that being our towing tank, seating density is also a big problem. So, uh, you know, how many of those dust particles can we put in there uh, in the towing tank? You know, we're filling up a, a towing tank that's, you know, hundreds of thousands of gallons. You know, it, it takes a lot of seating to get a nice dense, uh, a densely seated image so that we can, the software could properly analyze the, the flow fields for us. Um, and the other thing is that it was actually hard to measure the forces uh, near to the body of the robot at all places. So we could only take a couple of images. Uh, we looked at three or four locations along the length of the eel and we had to um, kind of interrogate between or interpolate what was going on between those uh, couple of images because ideally we would like to have taken a, an infinite number of slices or uh, images at an infinite number of locations along the length to get that flow field adequately uh, assessed. But uh, you know, we did what we could in the time that we had, uh, and we were able to to kind of supplement some of the experimental work with some of the numerical work. Okay, so this is kind of a rendering of the setup that we used for analyzing that boundary layer flow. So uh, here we had more of a vertical orientation of that laser light sheet as opposed to when we were looking at the wake, we had more of a horizontal orientation. So the the modularity of the uh, the torpedo setup was real advantageous here. Uh, and we were looking at snapping images from the side as before with the wake survey, we were actually snapping images from above the, um, the wake. So here we're looking from the side. Um, this is kind of a setup of how that, our, our photograph of how that setup looked in the, uh, in the towing tank as well. So you're looking from above here, you can see we use the same tethering setup. Uh, this time the uh, PIV was set up uh, lateral to the uh, eel-like robot instead of behind the eel-like robot. Uh, you can see on top of the carriage, we had strapped all the computer that we needed to collect the data or collect the images on. We have our laser power supply there as well. Um, all the laser is actually on top of the water and we use a periscope-like uh, piece of equipment to direct that laser beam down below the water. Uh, so that, couple more images of the eel in the water. Uh, in the left, 
the upper left image, you can see a photograph of us actually shining the laser on the eel while we were recording some of the, uh, the images. Um, and you can see that glare that I was talking about, right? We're using a very high powered laser uh, to snap, uh, to illuminate those particles. And when we get close to that skin, we get a little bit of glare and that sort of messes with the images. Um, when we were done, when we get the images and we kind of post-process the results, uh, what we end up with are some experimental results that look like this, where we're able to see the velocity fields, right? So these are actually vector fields. I don't know why my presentation keeps skipping on me, but um, sorry about that. But here you can see the velocity fields and, and kind of what they look like to us. And these are different uh, time steps throughout one cycle of the uh, the swimming motion. So what you see here is a cross section of that eel moving uh, from right to left. So again, we can only take images on one side of the eel because the water particles are are blocking the camera's, I'm sorry, the eel robot is blocking the camera's view on the other side. So what we did was we, we took images on one side and then we uh, took images on the other side and we were able to stitch those together. Okay, so you can kind of see uh, some of the boundary layer separation uh, in these photos. Okay, and some of the conclusion uh, from the experiment, conclusions from the experiments are, as you see here, is that we had higher uh, skin friction is observed at some of the locations, expected locations. Uh, the local wake behavior is difficult to capture near the tail using PIV uh, due to unsteady boundary layer fluctuations. Uh, and the motion amplitude and frequency are not as influential on local skin friction than anticipated. So one of our initial hypotheses was that, you know, if we wanted to generate more thrust, we needed more tail amplitude. Well, we, we thought initially that the more tail amplitude we were putting into our robot, the more frictional resistance we were getting. And we kind of found out that that wasn't necessarily the case. Also, in order to generate more thrust, uh, we can make the, the tail uh, wag faster. Uh, so we it can increase that frequency. Uh, we thought that may be playing a role on the, uh, the local skin friction as well in, in the experiments kind of said it may be a little bit, but not as much as we anticipated. Um, so the actual forward speed that the, the robot's moving appears to be the most critical in producing changes to the actual frictional drag. So that was uh, an important conclusion there. All right, so with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Srivastava, who will talk to you about some of the numerical analysis that we did. Oh, thank you, Doctor. Uh, hi, everyone. So as Dr. Tanavala discussed that there was few limitations to the physical experiments and to circumvent that we use a technique called computational fluid dynamics. Now it is a method of solving very complicated celebrated mathematical equation called Navier-Stokes equation given by Claude Navier and Sir George Stokes. Uh, using modern day computer and numerical technique, one can solve the Navier-Stokes equation to predict any flow of fluid in any given environment. Of course, it does come with its own limitations, but for many engineering problems, it gets the job done. The technique of CFD also helps us to validate the experimental results and also to optimize the geometry, which in case the eel uh, with a fraction of the cost so that we don't have to repeat the experiments or you know, 3D print the eel again. We can just go in the computer, change the shape size and just do the simulation again. However, this equation is really complicated and looks really, really scary. And that's why I haven't put it on the slide. Um, can I have the next slide? All right. Now to model this flow problem in software called ANSYS, what we do is design a cylinder, as you can see that dark snake-like thing, and move it in a specified motion using user-defined functions. Then place this in a large tank so that we can put water or any fluid over it. The boundaries of the tank are really supposed to be far away so that they don't affect the flow around this eel. And then we prescribe the boundary conditions and together this is called the computational domain as you can see in the picture. Uh, next slide. Uh, 
Yes, now to solve the Navier-Stokes equation, we must discretize this computational domain into small cells, as you can see in the picture. Since we are interested in the drag and thrust produced by the eel, we have to capture the accurate flow physics near to the body of the eel. To do so, I use the technique called overset meshing. Uh, next slide. Now, as you can see in this picture on the left, that's the close up of the head of the eel, and on the right, that's a close up of the tail of the eel. As you can see, the motions of the tail are really large. Now, overset mesh is a technique in which the mesh around the body is separate than the background, but they overlap each other, exchanging information at the overset boundaries. By this way, I could keep the background mesh stationary and move the body mesh uh, freely. So a full disclosure, uh, I think it took us about 2 million cells to actually model this problem. And to get a 10 seconds of simulation, um, it took us 15 days at each computer to get the results. Uh, can I have the next slide? All right, so the final results. So here is a plot of velocity predicted at one time step. Uh, we can see the wake structure consisting of two vortex sheet up and down and each shed is actually made up of pair of vortices circulating in opposite direction. What we observed using this specified equation that we discussed in the initial, uh, in the beginning of the presentation is that the strength of these vortices when you use this equation is low and they dissipate really quickly which in turn actually reduces our drag uh, can i have the next slide here are actually few pictures of the predicted velocity and the wake structure at different time step um can i see the next slide and yes that's actually a video of our simulation uh, what you see is actually the longitudinal cross-section taken at mid of the computational domain. Oh, can I see the next slide? Yes, here is a 3D structure of the vortex in the wake. The left one is actually performed at the optimal speed or a speed that we found was little less than the design speed. And the right one is performed at, the, uh, at a very high speed. As discussed before, they appear to be in pair and using this analysis, uh, what we saw is the structure of these vertices are actually hair, hairpin like structure, which is really important because it does match what actual eel in reality produces when they swim. Um, can I have the next slide? So in conclusion, we observe a slight variation from the theory in terms of vertices, but the effect of it is very small. Therefore, this proposed motion has helped us to attain efficiency of about 84% as compared to actual yield motions, uh, which gives only 30%. So in future performing optimization studies and more CFD simulations are required uh, to achieve even higher efficiency and lower vertex shedding at different and higher speeds. Uh, now I hand over the presentation to Dr. Brandon. All right, thank you, Shivan. All right, so um, the next slide is is a little bit about uh, kind of an offshoot from the original project that we had with the Navy, uh, where they actually funded uh, three years ago a summer camp that we had for middle and high school students. So here with this summer camp, what we were able to do is bring in uh, about a dozen or so students and we taught them various things about 3D printing, 3D modeling, hydrodynamics, how to build a robot, uh, how to design robot pieces, how to computer program. So all these different aspects of engineering and at the end of the camp at the end of the week uh, they were able to, to take their toy eels into the swimming pool at the university and, and have a little competition where they raced them against each other uh, this camp has uh, was actually we took 2020 off for the pandemic and then we came back last year for 2021 uh, and had another camp with about 16 students and we we're looking forward to our camp this summer uh, and each year we get a different sponsor. Uh, so the camp is, is generally completely free to those students that come. Uh, 
So, you know, it allows us to kind of share with these, the younger generation, uh, some of the technology that we're working with. Uh, they got to actually see some of our lab facilities. You know, there's our 3D printer in the back. So that uh, in the upper left machine uh, picture here in the, in the uh, this black box is actually our one of our larger 3D printers. Uh, so they actually got to use that machine and, and use our lab facilities. And it was a nice experience, I think, for most of them. Uh, this slide here has a, a video of our eel swimming uh, in various stages. So I'll just let that play uh, for now. And, uh, mostly just doing some surface swimming. Uh, we were playing around with some maneuvering as well, but we've never really done a lot of formal testing on the maneuvering other than just to, to see if we could do it. So you'll see it kind of steering around in our towing tank. Oh, this is a good view of our towing tank as well. You can see it's, uh, you know, the length of it here, as I said before, it's about 125 feet. We actually have a wave maker on the opposite end, so that gray wall that you see on the other end is actually a hydraulically driven flap, so we could generate uh, different type of sea state environments when we're doing ship model testing in here. All right, so with that, uh, I'd like to give some acknowledgments to the Office of Naval Research uh, that supported this project, as well as a lot of the equipment purchases, including that PIV uh, piece of equipment, as well as the uh, 3D printer that we used. And if anybody has any uh, questions, I'll be happy to take them, and I appreciate everybody's attention. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you very much, doctors. Yeah. That was great. Thank All you. I have to say is I want one. Hey, boss, I want one. <laughs> um, my question is, is so we talked about these these ill camps for kids. Are there ill camps for adults? Um, is there any way that Mert and I can come to UNO and build robotic eels? Well, the original idea was that we we have eel camps for teachers, so that middle and high school science and math teachers could actually come and we would give the camp to the teachers and then they could take that uh, knowledge back to their classroom and give as many camps as they want. So we, we could provide them the kits, the models, the plans and all that stuff, but it kind of morphed into, uh, why don't you guys just do it <laughs> instead of the students. <laughs> no, that's exceptional because they get access to, to the researchers or get to, who are actually making these. I mean, that's kind of, that's nice. Right, so also when we invite the students, we usually, uh, we usually fund one of their teachers to come in for the week as well. So, you know, last year we had uh, two teachers uh, come in and, and kind of learn with the students and they participated in the, in the camp with the students. Um, how would students and or a teacher 
um, apply or register for the camp? It, it kind of depends on who's funding the camp that year. Um, so the first year was kind of just a, um, uh, let's see if we could do it. So we were linked up with a local uh, high school and their robotics club, as well as a local middle school and their robotics team. So we just basically invited those students uh, just to kind of give it a, a first run. Uh, last year, we kind of got funding at the last minute. So uh, we, we basically, again, just called a local school and had them come up uh, this coming year because of the grant we had to partner with a particular school uh, initially when we wrote the proposal so in that case we had to take the students from that particular school um, we hope to have it uh, you know more open funding where we could actually invite just about anybody or just kind of have an open call uh, but right now it, it, some of these grants really uh, kind of define who you have to invite to these camps or you know what types of schools or things like that so unfortunately right now the, the access is a little bit limited but we're hoping in the future to kind of have a, a funding source where we could open that access up perfect i just asked because i got eight people who might be interested in attending someday. <laughs> say hi guys hello <laughs> We have Glen Glenbrook School with us this evening. Um, so uh, for the audience that's at home, if you have questions, please, um, a lot of you are using the question function, but if you um, now would like to ask some questions of our speakers, please feel free to use that question box. I did have some that came in during the talk. So um, if it's okay with you guys, I will just start with those. Um, so I had a question come in about how how you get the servals to act independently of each other to control that movement of the eel. Um, so we pre-program the motion uh, using an Arduino controller. So each servo is wired up towards that Arduino. So it's it's sending serial signals to those servos to basically give it a position at uh, a different time step. So it's doing that uh, simultaneously to all, I think we have 18 or 19 servos in the latest revision of the, the model. So it's it's sending signals to those uh, servos simultaneously. And how long does it take you to program something like that? <laughs> um, actually, we, we have a, um, a Python script where we can put in a few parameters like uh, thrust, design speed uh, and so forth. And it has that equation that I had on one of the initial slides built in and it automatically uh, sets the angle of the servos. So that initial program took us a while to write. Um, but once we have it now, it's it's a matter of minutes just to go ahead and, and transmit that motion uh, to the robot. And we communicate to the robot wirelessly so we don't have to take it apart, take its brain out reprogram the brain we're actually communicating to that robot wirelessly so we can do everything on a pc and just send the signals right to the robot can you do that even while it's underwater yeah that is one of the limitations so we are using radio for that so uh in some of the initial pictures the the antenna we have to have it very close to the robot uh so for what we were doing that was fine uh so if, you know some of the pictures you can see the antenna was about 12 inches or less from the brain so anything further than that you know and these are really uh, uh very strong transmitters so in the air you can transmit over miles but underwater you can only transmit you know less than a foot with the same transmitter so um so yeah so we have been looking at some other forms of communication in, in terms of acoustic or optical uh but for now at least you know the, the project that we were working on uh the wireless worked using the radio signals. That's great. And um, this question is for all three of you, really. I think it would fit into any kind of uh, scientific research. But you mentioned that the the inspiration behind the, the robotic eel came from an eel in nature. So uh, one question that came in was, how often do scientific research endeavors come from um, observations that you make in nature and then specifically for the robot um, 
how, or even Craig, this would kind of fit into your research that you do um, deep sea work, but how does that make uh, marine science technology and robotics technology advance or make it better? Um, sure, I guess I'll, I'll go first. Is you know we, yeah. we learn a lot <laughs> from what's going on in nature. Um, so like I said, this project originally started where uh, my PhD advisor was was doing studies with marine biologists. Um, so it, it required us to do a lot of uh, journal article reviews on people that actually study live eels. Um, so there are people using the same type of setup that I am using PIV uh, with lasers and water particles to study the hydrodynamics around eels. Um, the problem we have with actually using eels is, you know, we had a very particular motion and, and uh, I'm not an eel whisperer and I don't know many people that are that can actually tell the eel, hey, take this shape when you swim and use this frequency. So, um, you know, there is a lot to be learned, but, you know, maybe there's some things that we can uh, take and extend to actually improve efficiency and in, in, in how we move things through water. Um. Dr. Craig, you want to go first? <laughs> oh, I was just going to say, yeah, I mean, there's lots of examples where engineers um, have borrowed from, you know, life, basically, our, the you know, the world around us in terms of, you know, whether it be in the oceans or on land, you know, we'll have a researcher later um, in this series who is developing robotic jellyfish. Um, and, and so, um, you know, it, evolution basically uh has basically found lots of creative solutions to problems and so we we use evolution and what it's and what that process has created to sort of inspire us and um although it's important and i think uh you know uh that brandon touched on this which is that we that evolution is not perfect um it doesn't find perfect solutions it finds just good enough solutions and so um, whereas we take, can take inspiration from them, you know, you know, um, like especially, you know, here as they talked about tonight, is that there are room, there's still room for improvement and refinement and things along, along that line. And so, in terms of advancing, I mean, we've, you know, the way, you know, the biggest exam, the best example I could come up with is, you know, they've used, um, there is a grabbing uh, system that's based on the way that octopuses move their arms and things like that and they've adapted that to put on the front of like remote operated vehicles these underwater robots to help grab soft squishy things and so they can use these you know these robotic octopus tentacles to kind of grab things that they wouldn't normally be able to grab because they would crush in a metal jaw and so you know there's just lots of ways in which we've sort of been bio-inspired so to speak Yeah, for uh, actually for me also, um, I'm not, um, I haven't, I don't have that much years of uh, research experience as Dr. Craig and Dr. Brand, but for me, it's just a simple basic definition of science is you observe something, you get curious about it, and you want to learn more about it. And once you get a hang of it, you want to innovate out of that idea or technology. So, yeah, for me, it's almost every time inspiration <laughs> comes from nature. <laughs> that's that's kind of cool. Um, curiosity, right? Science. Um, what is so? This was a very interesting question that came in um, a little bit earlier in your talk. Um, but I, it's a really good question, so I want to make sure that we we hit this one. But um, question came in what is the hardest part of designing robotics for water versus land I, I think the biggest one is communication to that robot i think we kind of hit on that earlier is that um it's it's very difficult to send real-time signals to those robots um you know like you, you it's easy to communicate on land using radio waves but when you put those radio waves underwater everything comes to a screeching halt. So we haven't gotten to this part yet because, you know, we were just looking at one particular motion, but if we really wanted to take this the next step and have this 
robot uh, swim on its own underwater, it would almost, it would definitely have to be autonomous or at least semi-autonomous where we would program a prescribed motion and have it be able to uh, make decisions on its own in case it got into some trouble because we wouldn't be able to actually control it. Uh, you know, some of the, the uh, robots that are flight robots or drones, let's say, they can actually be controlled in real time. Some of them are autonomous, but, you know, we don't have that. It's very difficult to control it in real time. So I think that's kind of the, the biggest thing we have. So that would be like artificial intelligence is what you're that would kind of lead to like yeah getting... that would lead to artificial intelligence you know what happens when this eel uh swims into a rock would it know to go around it or would it just keep trying to swim and trying to go through the rock you know if somebody if a human let's say was controlling that remotely they could say okay i'm not moving i'm, I'm stuck let me back up let me recontrol it but you know in in real time uh you know we, we can't really send those signals to the to the robot uh, so it would have to be able to make some of those decisions on its own and have a almost an onboard memory or an onboard brain to to process that stuff. That's really cool. Um, another question came in when you were talking about um, making improvements to the different versions of the robot. But um, Mike asked, um, are you constantly looking for ways to improve the robot and then when do you know that you've gotten as good as it's going to get and when if you're just going to constantly strive for perfection i think is what he's after or is there going to be some point where you just say this can't get any better um let's move on yeah there's, there's a little bit of both i guess um you know we we do kind of designate a certain time period where, hey, we're going to work on the robot design for this time. But at the end, we're looking for propulsive characteristics. So we got to perform these tests in the water and assess uh, the hydrodynamic performance of the robot. So we got to kind of draw the line in the sand at some point so where we can actually put the robot in the water. Uh, one of the initial grad students that worked on the project, you know, he was very much a perfectionist and he, and he was like, we had to say, okay, you need to stop because we need to run the test. If not, we're never going to get anything done. Um, he was, you know, so in that case, you know, I could, we had a box of parts that I used to show whenever I would give people tours of schools, like, hey, this is kind of the advantage of 3D printing because we would have all these different iterations of robot segments. Um, and this is what we were thinking back then. And this is what we're thinking now because of what we learned along the way. So it was kind of cool to see that progression of how things change. But at some point, we kind of had to stop, put it in the water, and actually see how it performed, and then uh, maybe make one more revision at that point, and kind of go from there and kind of stick with it. But you know, we're always looking for for ways to improve it. Uh, we did a lot of work, uh, not so much with the physical parts of the robot, but more with the electronics and how things are wired or how things are powered uh, and how things are programmed. So a lot of the stuff that you can't really physically see. Um, you know, there were a lot of things done on the backside later on in the project. Perfect. Um, we had a question come in just now. Yes, that is a fire extinguisher right there. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yes, yeah, so that's our fire extinguisher in our teaching classroom. Um, thanks for that question. <laughs> um, what? Um, this is a math question. We have a math question. Um, so uh, the question came in when we were talking about um, the Stokes equation. Is that, did I get that name right? Um, yeah. <laughs> great. That's so right. uh, so advancement seems to be the theme of our, of our audience tonight. But they're wondering if you're learning anything about that equation that's um, advancing that equation or maybe learning uh, leaning to an equation that will have your name on it? <laughs> uh, I wish. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, honestly speaking, at this point, this is a very old equation and still has a million dollar prize on it because of there's a certain proof uh, which mathematicians are working on. So if anybody cracks it, they're gonna get a million prize. It's one of those seven celebrated equations and 
this is the best way i can put it it works but nobody knows how but it works so nobody can prove it mathematically its existence and proof um i really love it and uh, i do uh, research on it because this equation uh, can give us answer to one of the world's biggest problem is to understand turbulence in nature so it may have some hidden answers and hopefully one day <laughs> might have my own <laughs> <laughs> nice i i hope you get your own equation that would be Thank so you. cool but I want an autograph at that point. <laughs> so, so another question about the maneuverability. Um, you talked about um, maybe being able to maneuver it a little bit. Um, uh, Janet had a question about how do you even go about maneuvering an eel? Us. Uh, so what we did was we, we took the same shape motion that we had that equation for on like slide number three or wherever it was, and we superimposed an arc shape on it. So um, what that did was it sort of redirected the thrust laterally. Um, so that's, you know, kind of where we were, where we could amplify the arc on that shape and uh, steer it either left or right. Um, we do still have some limitations in what I call vertical maneuvering or rising and diving. Um, we did study that a good bit as well, but uh, that is actually a very tough problem for us to figure out at the small scale. Is it is it just a question of being able to get the thrust to force it down? Or? We tried stuff like that. Uh, it, we tried changing the buoyancy. Uh, that's about the best uh, luck that we had was we had a contraption on either end. It wasn't a very big contraption, but it actually made the head bigger and the tail bigger so we could change the buoyancy on the end. So it, when we would contract them, it would sink. When we would push it out, uh, it would it would rise. But with our skin being uh, originally was a latex rubber, uh, when you compress the head, it would actually compress the air, which would expand the skin. Um, so you you kind of start chasing your tail literally at some point. <laughs> That's awesome. And um, our last question, um, our audience got you right on the button, eight o'clock. Um, wants to know what species or body form you're taking on next. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we do have some extensions of the theory to uh, like a manta ray swimming or stingray type swimming. So um, that's kind of always been on the back burner. So if anybody knows anybody who's interested in funding that research, we're happy to take it on. That would be so hard to engineer, I would think. Oh. I think the idea again comes from nature. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Have oh. you ever thought about combining an eel and an eagle together? <laughs> Not at all. Good, that... because that would be illegal. <laughs> you are Sorry, I had to get on one more one. in before the <laughs> end of the like. You are sitting on that one, boss. Yeah, I was waiting for an opportune. I've been waiting for the last hour. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you got it in. that's awesome well it's eight o'clock you guys um our audience was fantastic thank you everyone for attending and i know that goes for me craig our two speakers and of course everybody else here at lumcon um so thank, thank you. you very much doctors we appreciate you joining us tonight no problem thank thanks for having so us much. thank you and our audience was amazing. You guys had some really awesome questions. Um, and thanks for the math question too. That was awesome. So with that, we'll just give you your evening and hope to see you in two weeks at our next science talk. See you then. Thank you. Bye everyone. Thank you. Thank you.